so thank you for the uh, nice introduction, Sivan. I don't need to say anything more about myself then, but I will tell you a little bit about the background of this presentation. So the presentation is based on the TRIGGER study. Um, TRIGGER stands for Trends in Global Governance and Europe's Role. And this was a study that was conducted or is being conducted. It's still ongoing, actually, even though our part is up done, but it is being conducted for the EU's Horizon 2020 program and the Technical University of Munich or TUM, where I'm at, conducted the study with 14 partner institutions. And one of the main goals of the study is to understand how global governance and emerging technologies interact and what role the EU plays in this respect, in particular as a regulatory superpower, so-called, it's often called that. And uh, the TUM, uh, so we at the TUM focused on reviewing current governance regimes and EU initiatives concerning open standards and open source software or OSS. Um, and my co-author, Professor Tim Bute, and I uh, basically draw three main conclusions in our study. These conclusions are actually not the subject of today's presentation, so I'm just going to make a very short comment on them and then move on to the actual subject of the presentation. So what we found is that OSS and open standards can contribute to interoperability, um, especially if OSS developers implement APIs um, that are based on open standards. Second, to solve the conundrum between requiring complete openness and incentivizing investments in research and development, policymakers should mount a multi-stakeholder effort to redefine FAND licensing and potentially also adopt a system or a tiered system actually of licensing fees. And then as regards geopolitics, the prom promotion of OSS and open standards can be a powerful tool for states to improve their economic and political positions vis-a-vis -vis their rivals. And if you would like to learn more or read more about um, what we found out, uh, our study is available on the Trigger website and I've put the link in here if you want to look that up. Okay, so much for background. Um, I did have two poll questions. I don't think I'll make the attempt to do the poll now, um, but I was interested in whether you all thought that governments are more resilient now than they were 30 years ago and whether you think that the use of open source software and open standards increases government's resilience. So let me then talk about the actual subject of this presentation. Um, so we've seen huge technological changes in the last few decades. Um, and these have brought both risks and opportunities, of course. Um, so if you think about you know, the rise of the internet um, about 30 years ago, or now the rise of AI, right? We see that new technologies are an essential driver of economic growth, but at the same time, they can of course pose risks to humans, animals, and the environment. And these risks include known knowns. So these are things we know about, we know that there are certain risks and certain dangers that new technologies bring with them. Um, then there are known unknowns where we know there are risks, but we don't quite know like all aspects of them or how they will play out when technologies are adopted on a on a large uh, like on a large scale, let's say. And then uh, there are unknown unknowns where uh, sometimes we don't even know the kind of side effects of a new technology until it is adopted in a widespread manner. And I think that is a particular concern to policymakers. Um, if you think about something like geoengineering, for example, I think that's why there are some concerns about, around that because uh, there might be many unknown unknowns. Um, and new technologies, because they have these risks that they bring with them, also opportunities, but also these risks, uh, they raise complex policy challenges for policymakers. And the situation is complicated even further because there are, of course, dual use technologies. So this family of technologies that we summarize under the umbrella of AI, um, of course, are often oftentimes dual use. So they can be used for both military and peaceful ends, which makes it even harder to regulate them. Now, how do policymakers deal with this, right? How do governments respond? Because of course, we don't just simply want to say, okay, then we can't adopt any new technologies. We're just going to regulate and, and make sure that no te new technology is adopted. That's of course not the case. So uh, one principle that's being used widely in EU policymaking, also in the US, 
um, but we're focusing here on the EU, is the precautionary principle, which is detailed in Article 191 of the TFEU. And it was first applied in the field of environmental protection and basically advises risk prevention in the face of scientific uncertainty. Um, this means that if there is any kind of doubt whether um, something is risky or not, we should proceed with caution, essentially. And over the years, the scope of the precautionary principle slowly widened from, economic, from environmental policymaking to include consumer policy, food, and human, animal, and plant health. However, questions have arisen in recent years about the scope of the precautionary principle, whether maybe it is being used too widely and maybe societies are demanding or the public is demanding this very much unattainable goal of zero risk. So in response to these kinds of concerns about the uh, precautionary principle, the innovation principle uh, emerged in 2016, because while zero risk may seem desirable, there is a complex relationship between reducing risk and fostering uh, innovation and economic growth that policymakers need to take into account, because if societies don't innovate, they become very, very much stagnant, um, and that is not a good thing. Uh, but innovation, of course, brings with it a certain amount of risk. And so given the EU's comparatively weak position in the global tech industry, even though I have to say it is not quite as weak as some folks in the media are making it out to be sometimes, I think, but we don't have any of the huge internet platforms, for example. And so given this position, um, it has been suggested that the precautionary principle should be applied to a much narrower range of cases, and it should be counterbalanced with the so-called innovation principle, which was drafted in 2016 as part of an initiative to establish better regulations. And it is a much needed counterweight to the precautionary principle and basically holds that the Commission, the European Commission, will take innovation into account when drafting new initiatives. And so, therefore, it acknowledges that in order to have an innovative society and a growing economy, we need to accept a certain amount of risk. So, where does this leave us? So, on the one hand, there is the precautionary principle. On the other hand, there's the innovation principle. We understand that we need innovation. On the other hand, we don't want to endanger the safety and lives of humans, animals. We don't want to endanger the environment. And the innovation principle definitely should not be used um, to move away from precaution and adopt a regulatory laissez-faire approach. Um, so in recent years, scholars and policymakers that have looked at this conundrum have suggested that resilience is an important concept for striking a balance between precaution and innovation. And the resilience perspective basically acknowledges that not all risks of new technologies can be anticipated, but instead of then saying, okay, we need strict regulations governing the use of new technologies, the resilience perspective advocates the creation of societies, of governments and societies at large that can absorb future shocks stemming from technological innovation and from anything else really, but we focus on our study in the trigger study on technological innovation. Now you may say that is all well and good, but what does it actually mean to have a resilient government, a resilient society? Well, according to the OECD um, study from 2014, um, there are three capacities that underlie resilience. Absorptive capacity, adaptive capacity, and transformative capacity. And absorptive capacity refers to the ability of systems to use predetermined coping functions uh, in order to prevent and restore basic structures and essential functions in the face of negative impacts. So absorptive capacity very much refers to the short-term response to shocks, right? So when something happens, a so-called shock event happens, this could be a shock stemming from the introduction of new technologies, but it could, of course, also be something like an environmental disaster, a financial crisis, um, challenges stemming from migration, whatever it is, right? The absorptive capacity, if it's high, means that a government can make sure that systems basically still function even in the face of such a shock, right? Adaptive capacity is something that is important for the medium to longer term, and that refers to a system's ability to change its structures and functions 
in order to take advantage of future opportunities and mitigate the impacts of potential negative events. So if you think like about something like AI being in, in use on a, on a wider scale now, um, adaptive capacity would mean that governments can react and say, okay, we want to take advantage of the opportunities created by AI, but we also want to mitigate its risks, right? And so if we need to change um, some structures, some functions of how we deliver public services, um, okay, we can do that, right? And uh, so that would be then high adaptive capacity if you can change systems to respond to such events in the medium to longer term. And finally, transformative capacity refers to the ability to create an entirely new system if the old system ends up being untenable, right? Sometimes that is the case, the old system no longer works, we need an entirely new system. And a government with high transformative capacity can then create such a system um, and it's possible to do so. Um, and I think when we look at the challenges that new technologies create, we see that one thing that is very important is how to respond to that with regulation, right? So in the medium term and in the long term, how do we basically make new regulations that mean that we can harness the opportunities of new technologies? And also, how can we then monitor that these regulations are actually being complied with? So to have uh, resilience as a government also means that there's a lot of regulatory agility, right? So maybe regulations will have to be updated more often. So that would be re regulatory adaptation that happens on a regular basis, um, or we need entirely new ways to, to make and monitor compliance with regulation. So how can we support resilience then knowing now the three capacities underlying it through the use of open source software and open standards. Well, resilient societies, as I said, are agile enough that they can handle the changes and shocks stemming from the introduction of new technologies and other events, of course. And open standards and OSS can support agility by making it easier for public policymakers to be quick and responsive and adaptive, which is a necessity today. So if a shock event happens, the use of OSS and open standards basically contributes to all three dimensions of resilience and also helps with that kind of agility, regulatory agility that I talked about earlier. So specifically, looking at absorptive capacity, how does OSS and open, how do OSS and open standards help us? Well, they're helpful when it comes to absorbing the impacts of a shock because they allow governments to make quick changes to important technological applications and infrastructure. OSS also gives organizations control over the technology they're using um, and allows them to adapt it as needed, at least if they have the right resources. This is something that I believe Emma will talk about in a minute here. Um, so for example, highly skilled developers are a very important research, resource. Um, so, But if those resources are in place, then OSS helps organizations to mount a fast and effective response in response to a shock. And, um, the use of OSS and open standards also makes government's technological infrastructure more secure, I believe. It makes it more transparent and flexible in the first place. So that means it makes it less likely that shock events related to something like hacking happen in the first place because you would simply have this global community, right, and all these sets of eyes on the code that make it less likely that, uh, you know, any bugs or anything slips through. So in that sense, open source is just a more resilient kind of software, I believe, in and of itself. Then looking at the second uh, capacity underlying resilience, adaptive capacity. So the use of OSS and open standards allows government, governments to adapt in response to the long-term effects of shocks or longer, medium to longer-term effects of shocks and thus contributes to their adaptive capacities because OSS and open standards enable many different players to be involved in the development of new technologies. And that leads to more innovation, a faster pace of change to basically the, the, the software, OSS software changes as quickly as the community will allow, right? And um, so it also leads to better adaptation to varying real world needs because there are so many different people involved, right? So 
there is just a much broader set of needs that will be represented, um, I believe, in such a community and therefore will find its way into the code, if you will. Um, also, the use of OSS and open standards enables actors in the relevant technology ecosystem to adopt reusable components, open APIs, and open interfaces into platforms and solutions, and that potentially increases the to market rate of new products and services. And that means that governments simply have a larger menu of options to choose from, which leads to more competition and therefore to lower prices, making it easier to adapt as needed, right? If you simply have more options, um at different price points right it is just easier to say hey here's what we need and now let's see what we can find out there in terms of options there are more options obviously you're in a better position and then finally transformative capacity so this third dimension of resilience is also helped uh, by OSS, by the use of OSS and open standards because they can help to ease the transitions to new technological solutions as in the case of adaptation, um, the use of OSS and open standards can lead to more innovation at a faster pace. And this in turn can reduce the time and cost of transformation efforts. However, one thing that is being debated in the literature, um, I should say it was debated especially strongly maybe about a decade ago or so, was whether the particular innovation model that is often associated with open standards and OSS, so a modular model, right, where basically um, innovation happens on top of a common, common, common plumbing, if you will, top of common infrastructure and differentiation uh, happens at higher, higher layers, right, is that really uh, suitable for producing the radical innovations required for technological transformation? This was a discussion a little while ago in the literature. And of course it is debatable, but I think it should be noted that the breakthrough ideas required for real transformation might be more easily achieved by a global community of developers, um, even though we saw that these developers <laughs> mostly work together with the people in their uh, proximity we saw in an earlier presentation but still it is a global community of developers and so this global community might more easily achieve these breakthrough ideas than a comparatively small group of employees working on proprietary technology also i think time has shown that yes oss can be absolutely transformative and innovative um so to sum up Given today's fast-paced technological change, governments basically need a way to bridge precaution and innovation and harness the potential of new technologies while minimizing their risks. And improving the resilience of governments and of society at large is an important concept and an important way for striking a balance between precaution and innovation. There are, as I mentioned, three capacities underlying resilience, absorptive capacity, adaptive capacity, and transformative capacity, and the use of OSS and open standards and government can strengthen all three of these capacities and therefore contribute to more resilient governments and societies that can more easily absorb and respond well to shocks created by the adoption of new technologies or other shock events as well. This was it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. And please feel free to connect via email or via Twitter or LinkedIn if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Great. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Oh, I'm hearing oh, myself. I'm hearing myself. Let's try again. Try again. Still hearing myself. Uh, no, could you mute yourself? Yep. One Thank you. <laughs> Everybody knows how it feels like to hear yourself. Uh, well, but thanks so much. This was super interesting. And my uh, political science heart uh, beat faster upon seeing a nice, um, uh, a nice structuralization uh, of these uh, three dimensions. Right. Um, now I would invite Emma to come back uh, to speak about um, their research, their, um, their report on government open source. Um, and let's see, I think we, we hope that we've uh, solved the, the issue uh, in the background. Now a lot of people are <laughs> having fun with the, the little whiteboard uh, feature here. Maybe not, I'm not sure. Uh, let's see, Emma, um, let us know when you're ready. Should also be presenter now.
I'm just trying a couple of different things because it seems to be <laughs> just does not seem to like me today. Um, but we why? did test it. There's always the always the beauty when you test something uh, and it works in the test uh, and then it doesn't work when <laughs> when you're actually live. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Well, I'll ah, do it. I'll do great. it this. I'll do it this way. This is not. Not how I was hoping to do it, but it works. All right, thank you. Then thanks, thanks for your patience. We, we've got it going. All right, well, um, thank, thanks so much for having me. Um, uh, Sivan, you've already done a perfect introduction, but I'm, I'm Emma Gowan. I'm a, a partner at Public Digital, and we're a small global consultancy, typically focused on helping leaders set the right institutional conditions for success to deliver digital transformation. Um, of which you know implementation of open sources is part of that um and uh, just a bit of minor background I, I worked in the uk government when this this policy was put in place to be open and use open source i was not the author of it i won't i won't claim any credit but i've i've really seen the impact of this and other initiatives um unfold i think quite favorably in the uk government up over the last few years and that's that's how i came to be quite enthusiastic about this topic as well um so we recently conducted a short study on creating the conditions for success on open sourced software. Um, it was qualitative, um, based on interviews with about 20 people across four different continents. Um, and essentially asking them what accelerates open source adoption um, and what blocks it. So I'll tell you a little bit about the context for the study, but not for too long. Um, our recommendations for governments uh, and then a little bit about a, a capability, capability model we developed to support that. Um, one moment. So in terms of context for the study, it's worth saying that open source software operates obviously right across the technology stack from frameworks, programming languages, libraries, components. Um, and the use case for, for many of those is probably a bit more straightforward. Um, and what we were looking at is the case around open source software that supports mission critical public service um, and, and how you might implement that and how the you know, public administrations might implement that. Um, so for example, a, a civil registration platform or a health management information system, really important things um, that will affect citizens' lives in, in quite a tangible way. Um, I'm not going to preach to the converted, and, and Nora's obviously just talked about some of the advantages of open source, but we know that open source can be a really powerful way to accelerate digital transformation. Um, you know, in the good version of that, it's, it's um, encouraging sharing and reuse, experimentation, um, connecting to a global community, many, many positives. Um, and, it, and it can also help governments move away from lock-in and create more competition and give the, the possibility of greater digital sovereignty. So there's a lot of promise in the in the way we talk about open source. But it is a bit more complicated than that when it comes to imp implementation. So what we what we heard from interviewees is that these factors don't don't make up the full picture. And some of the, the really great qualities of open source, they don't guarantee implementation success. Um, and this is obviously true of any technology project. But we're thinking specifically about that kind of conditions for success for open source. Um, but if you implement you know, a big open source service without preparation, it can be just as disastrous as a big bang proprietary technology project. Um, and it feels a bit uncomfortable to say that out loud. Um, we don't want to say it. Um, but I think if we want open source software to be meet its potential, and to be as successful as we think it should be, it's really important to have a, an honest conversation about how to make it successful. Um, there's, a, there's a reality that in the development of, of larger scale services and infrastructure, um, a decision between proprietary software and open source alternatives becomes a bit more complicated because the advantages of um, implementing open source software meet the reality of implementing anything big in government. So, Given all that, what do we what do we think governments could could or might do to make themselves more successful? So we think they need to take action in in four areas. And before I start, I'll say we tried to make these as broadly applicable as possible for you know big administrations and small, um, and, and be no regrets no regrets things to do that in the ecosystem in your policy and your governance. 
will help. Um, it's it's um, there's always there's always more you can do. So we'll talk about the policy environment, about in-house skills and capabilities, open source, vendor ecosystem, and then sustainability. Um, so this is one of our interviewers. He, um, he said to us, "Political stability is essential, and where there is instability, the whole process halts." Um, I think, I think anyone who's worked with governments will uh, will recognise this. Um, and the most important thing to say here is that it's very hard for an initiative to survive if it's attached to one political leader. So what you don't really want is a politician who feels very enthusiastically about open source who then disappears in a couple of years. That's not that's not enough. Um, it's nice, but it's not enough. Um, so uh, no regrets action really is to, to build political consensus and support for open source software adoption. And the aspect I'd really bring out here is um, to really think about what your strategic objectives are for adopting open source. What's the strategy and purpose behind that adoption? Um, it could be that, you know, the primary motivation is about digital sovereignty, or it could be about reducing lock-in, but understanding those objectives um, is going to make your policy more successful. Um, and secondly, the aspect of, of um, developing a decree or a policy or a law, we've seen in some cases that it's a positive, it's a good thing to have a policy or a law. It shows, um, it shows political intent, but it's not enough on its own. So you need to, to understand your strategic objectives, build some consensus among leadership, um, and perhaps put it into legislation if, if that works in your particular context. Um, the second part of that, uh, in that kind of policy environment, is to, to publish a government technology strategy, which includes clear objectives for open source software. So by all means, have something about open source that's standalone, but make it part of a whole technology strategy. Um, you know, we'd, in, we'd encourage governments to think about an open architecture approach building systems from discrete, well-defined components, um, integrated using open standards, which I've, I've heard being talked about a bit today, um, and explicitly encourage reuse within public administration. These things together are going to make your open source implementation more, more successful. Um, uh, and there is a, a nuance here that I think is worth drawing out, which is the, the publish aspect. Um, the UK Technology Code of Practice, which includes this directive around the be open and use open source it's it's published it's in the open it's clear um, and often vendors will read this as well so it's, it's trying to make this policy both whole and accessible and the accessible part is a bit the bit I think that sometimes gets missed um, if your policies in the the deepest dark corner of your your website on, on a PDF then you might might struggle for it to get any traction um, and then on to on to on to leadership um, and internal capacity. So um, this this came up, I think, in almost every single interview, and it's and it's no surprise. In in-house capacity was seen as such a critical condition for success, and it needs to be top down in leadership um, and bottom up in teams as well. So in settings with significant capacity to direct open source policy. Or where it's a, a political priority, it, it it might be appropriate to set up a open source program office, which I've I've seen um, referenced as well. But if you don't have that size, just just start by making a central official or team responsible for for setting that policy. Um, having having the ownership and accountability of it, even if it is just in one person, is is a great place to start. Um, and so there's the sort of the formal side of that, setting a, a lead. There's also a community side. So think about how you can find champions and develop a, an internal community around open source. We find in, in lots of aspects of digital government, there will be people in the administration working on these things, looking for allies and looking for community. So if there's a way to bring that together, to, to find out, Who's already doing things? Can you share that? Can you can you bring teams? Can you share best practices? Um, creating that internal community will also help you in the long term. 
Um, uh, and the other thing, and this is sort of tangential, but I think quite important, is to encourage reuse within government. Um, I hear it often, often talked about in um, global kind of digital, digital transformation teams, this idea of sharing software across administrations. And um, it would be brilliant. It would be really nice. And it does happen in, in certain settings. We've seen examples of that. Um, but my experience as a practitioner working in governments is that just getting different government agencies to share um, anything can be a challenge. Um, so it's really important to encourage reuse in your, you know, just in things that you're doing. It's a really good start and it, and it helps teams to develop that muscle. Um, if you can find opportunities to release publicly funded code in the open, it really increases understanding and technical capacity. And it means that if you're then adopting something that's been developed externally, you've got you've got more of a technical skill in order to, to be able to do so. Um, procurement. <laughs> so this is um, about creating demand. And um, I'm really conscious that we only went into this lightly. And this is a, a huge topic. So this is a, a minimum bar, if you like, which is to say you've got to review your procurement policies and practices to ensure they aren't inadvertently blocking open source software. Um, this can be this can be done in a couple of different ways. So it might be that a, a focus on enterprise scale and service is, is just blocking experimentation on anything um, that can happen. It can also happen that um, it, it can also happen that um, the way the government is typically procuring things, which is, you know, long requirements, documents and big programs, the sort of whole structure of that procurement is inadvertently locking open source out. So there's a, um, a starting point to have a look at that and perhaps talk to local vendors and understand if that's the case. Um, in the longer term, governments need to develop a range of procurement options for buying software and related services. So they need to um, allow, allow smaller procurements, allow outcomes, um, allow experimentation. I'm, I'm really conscious this is a, a huge topic, but um, open source often gets, often gets blo blocked in the procurement world. So it's a, it's a, a good thing to look at. Um, and this is uh, something one of our government interviewees said to us. So, talking actually about the vendor ecosystem in his country and he said open source can require a higher level of tech expertise you have to deeply understand the code base of the software you're adopting in order to customize it and accept decisions developers have made and in this context he was saying well what's the incentive for, for local vendors to to use open source software when they're currently you know essentially got a, a better more profitable delivery model from just bespoking and building their own stuff. Um, and this was in a government where actually the, the adoption of open source is, is quite high, but, but still there's this tension with local vendors. So um, it's important, and I heard this talked about earlier as well, but to, to grow and support the local ecosystem of vendors. So if, if we want to break lock-in, then actually it's, it's really important that more than one vendor can support your open source implementation. Um, you know, if, if you're implementing something that one, one big global company can support, then that's not really solving your strategic aims, if, if that was one. So having a think about how you can promote new business models built around open source software and, you know, encourage vendors, incentivize them in a different way, grow that community, um, that is something that every government, I think, should be thinking about. Um, and the last last section of recommendations um, before I wrap up, um, this is a, a, a kind of a sensitive topic when we talk about funding open source. And there's a lot of misconceptions. There's there's a sort of idea that because there isn't a licensing cost, that open source will be lower cost as a whole, and it and it might be. Um, but there's also there's also some tensions where 
big big vendors might offer substantial discounts for adoption and might ramp up their costs later. So there's there's different ways to look at the costs of, of um, any kind of software implementation. So our recommendation here is just look at the full picture, understand the whole life cycle, um, and, and and know that any software is going to require um, going to require money in the long term, essentially. But really digging into that and factoring it in is is important. Um, you know, one of our interviewees really highlighted the need to make governments aware of the costs that are required for consultants or staff during implementation, um, which, seem, which seems obvious. But actually, if you've been if you've been pitched something as low cost, um, you might just have a misconception and that will and that will make you feel like the software is not successful. Um, so a full understanding is, is really quite important. Um, and then. The next part of this is thinking about how you support your implementation in the long term. So this is a, another government interviewee who said, if we were to use a community version of open source software, we would need to ensure we have a competent internal team that can maintain it. And that's that's absolutely right. Um, if it's something that's critical to government, you can't necessarily rely on um, something that's just community supported. Maybe you could if it was small. Um, but the more you scale up, the more you need support. Um, there isn't a, a kind of a, a right or wrong answer here, but it's it's thinking about what support you might have available to you. So um, you might start with free support through a mature community. So if you're just doing an, a simple implementation or a small pilot, um, that might be fine. Get some free support for for something um, uh, without too much custom, you know, bespoke elements, you might be able to get support and maintenance through um, the developer of the open source software or through a separate vendor. Um, having options, I think, is, is the best thing here. Um, ideally, you want something where you can you can get that service from more than one vendor so that you'll you can swap between them. Or in some cases, you might need full commercial support. So if there's a you might, might need, need it. Knowing you go standing. Um, there are. Emma, can you hear me? There seems to be a connection issue. Let's oh. see if, if we're... I think I think it works now again. But maybe could you back up around 30 seconds? Um, oh, sure. I think, it was a, we think we had a connection issue for a little bit. So just the previous slide, uh, kind of halfway through, I would say. This one? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think you, you came almost to the last point, actually. Um, uh, but there we lost... Perfect. Uh, lost uh, heat. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so uh, yes, just if you're doing a more complex implementation, um, something that could be, you know, economy scale or for all your citizens, you might need full commercial support. Um, planning, planning for that, factoring it in, understanding it is, and having options is really, really important. Um, and the last one, um, I think this is my last one. Is, is just to kind of engage with the global open source community. So um, by sharing experience in the open and contributing, um, that's another part of building technical capacity, encouraging a vendor ecosystem. There are lots of benefits. Um, and there's, there's sort of just a principle of if, if, um, if as a policy you want to adopt open source, actually balancing that by participating in yourself, um, it is a is a really good way to to embed the capacity throughout what you do. It's it's there's lots of parts to that. Um, just as, you know, a kind of we'd always say to start small. Like if if there's an administration that hasn't really got experience implementing open source, is to try not to start by you know implementing something that's going to affect every citizen in the long term. Try and find smaller projects to start with. 
share in open um, and, and find your peers because there are lots of governments doing this, experimenting with it. Um, so learning from them and sharing lessons is, is, is hugely valuable. Um, and I'm just going to share, and I'm conscious of time, but I'll just share, we, we, as part of this report, we developed an open source capability model to help governments understand their capabilities and strengths. Um, uh, you could be, you know, could, could be like quite low on maturity and still have plenty of capacity to, to adopt open source. But it's sort of a, a self-assessment tool to be able to see where you are and essentially assess where your strengths and weaknesses are, where you might need to um, build up your capacity. It's open source and, and free to use naturally. <laughs> um, so you can go and have a look at that after this. I'll, I'll put a comment in the chat. Um, and this report is also published on our website. I'll, I'll put a link to that as well. Um, I'd love, I'd love um, uh, feedback, questions, ideas, um, big gaps, things we've missed. Um, I'd really love a discussion on it. So please do do free to follow up with me. Great, and maybe we have a few minutes also to have a discussion now. Uh, Nora, you, uh, you know, you're invited to also come back uh, onto the you know stage, I guess it is here, uh, because we have a, a great uh, discussion already happening in the chat. So I'm thinking maybe we pick up on that a little bit. There was a question originally asked asked by Johannes to you, Nora, Nora, about uh, the unique risks of using open source. Suppose, let's say, um, supposed unique risks. Not to upset anybody, um, you know, he, um, Johannes mentions incidents such as left pad and, and the heartbeat bug, um, and of course the situation that I think everybody is aware of and that we're going to talk about a little bit in the next section uh, on digital infrastructure, um, that sometimes uh, an extremely critical project is being supported by very few individuals or maybe even only one individual, um, and then something goes wrong and suddenly half of the internet uh, has a big issue, or maybe even the whole internet has a big issue. Um, I also have some thoughts on it, but it's interesting. Today, actually, um, um, the Open Knowledge Foundation uh, published a report on a sovereign tech fund. Um, that's quite interesting. Maybe have a look at that, um, because the ministry, I think it's the Ministry of Economy in Germany funded this. A sovereign tech fund essentially supporting, financially supporting basic open source infrastructure. Um, so that's kind of a, um, a hot off the press uh, uh, situation. But okay, now I'll hand it to you, Nora, and of course, Emma, uh, also um, uh, feel free to jump in. I'm sure there's a lot of thoughts on that regarding resilience. Yeah, so thank you for the question, Johannes. Um, so the way we decided to split out this presentation was indeed that I emphasized a lot of the positive aspects of open source and then Emma had some caveats on how to make open source projects a success, right? So, but in the actual trigger study, we actually talk also about um, exactly the issues that you mentioned, Johannes. Um, so basically, yes, it is critical, which also I think chats with Emma's presentation, right? It is critical to have the organizational capabilities to make sure that open source is actually used in a successful way, right? So um, what we suggest in the trigger study is that, uh, especially if OSS is used in domains with high safety requirements, it is vital to ensure that good security measures are in place. and. What we mean by that is that vendor selection processes must follow high standards, testing procedures must be best in class, and any licensing issues also must be fully worked out before deployment. Um, and then um, to talk about what you said, there's often, you know, you said small group of people that maintains the code, and that can be an issue because they can't do everything. Yes, that is true. And so we think some of these um, internal procedures that I just um, mentioned would help with that. But then also <laughs> there is sometimes the issue that actually a vulnerability is known, but organizations don't remove it from their own code base. If you think about the Equifax breach, that's exactly what happened, right? So it would be really important that governments also then make sure that you know, there is um, maintenance, good maintenance um, of regular maintenance of the code base, right? And that any known vulnerabilities are also tracked and removed. So yes, there do need to be some steps in place that have to do with the fact that it's often a small group of people that is maintaining the code, right? And so organizations need to be aware of that. 
Yeah, and, and I'll, I'll just add to that. I think it's 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 the case for any software. You know, there, there's um, it's it's well known now that security issues is going to come up, whether it's proprietary or open source. So I think as a, as a government, it's your responsibility to know what you're going to do about it when that problem does occur. So if, it, if it's proprietary software, then the responsibility is quite clear. You know you can go to that source. Um, if, it, if it's open source and it's maintained by a community, well, perhaps it's your responsibility to dive on in there. I don't, I don't have an answer, but I think you need, to, you need to know what your response is going to be. Yeah, and I, I agree there can be made an argument for saying that uh, governments have a role here to support kind of these basic uh, important infrastructure elements that a lot of uh, uh, a lot a lot of people rely on and are in some sense public goods uh, and that's really uh, you know that's really something where you could construct a case for for the government um i also thought maybe it's interesting uh, simon asked a question to emma uh, and i i uh, this is uh, this is a bit um this might be something where you have a lot of experience, which is on how can you make, let's say, um, procurement rules that are um, uh, favorable toward open source, um, implementable, better implementable, increase the efficiency of the implementation. Uh, I also have maybe two sentences to say, but uh, I'll let uh, people want to hear from you. <laughs> I would love to be able to solve this. I think it's um, remember it, it goes back to your objectives. Is what's what is open source unlocking for you, and putting that into your procurement, not and getting away from it must be open source. So um, open open APIs, open standards, all the things that complement that should actually lead your procurement in that direction. So I think we need to break it down, and that will help um, when it comes to procurement. And a, a secondary point is just in in principle, um, and someone else got asked about escalating risks in IT projects. Um, the bigger it gets, the more likely it is to fail. That's that's pretty well known. Um, starting small and experimenting favors open source and is generally a good thing to do. So if you can start at experimentation scale and build up from there, that should also help in the in the longer term. But I that is a study of its own that I that I would love to do and actually find best practice because um, we asked everyone we interviewed about this and didn't get really great answers of best practice, to be honest. I can, maybe, just, maybe just two sentences from my side because we also looked at it in the in the, in the commission study um, and uh, you know Simon mentions here enforcement. Um, and uh, that is very interesting because that's one of the aspects that we looked at. And there were a few cases around the world where uh, countries try to use enforcement toward their own administration to, to uh, uh, bring, let's say, um, implementation efficiency uh, toward these laws that they have. But those approaches all failed. It was completely impossible. It showed itself to be completely impossible to try to force the own administration to implement this. Um, and so one thing that we say a lot uh, these days is um, the aspect of culture um, and um, culture and awareness um, and trying to um, create an open innovation and openness culture within the organization um, and within those parts of the organization that, that interact with IT uh, and through that and this is where we have really seen approaches succeeding uh, through that um, uh, getting a, a, you know a more successful implementation of of such um, uh, mandates and then even the mandate is not, maybe not necessarily uh, necessary. Uh, something that also the Commission is now, I know, uh, looking into a little bit regarding interoperability, cross border interoperability um, uh, in the EU, uh, specific, not specifically on open source, but trying, trying to kind of improve um, cross border public sector interoperability and how to make that happen because the Commission sees itself in a position to, um, to kind of facilitate this, but kind of wondering itself how can we kind of make that efficient. And so the question. Uh, between enforcement and um, encouragement, I guess maybe it's a little bit there. Um, Noah, if you want to also reply to that one, don't let me don't let me stop you. Otherwise, I would maybe ask another question that somebody asked asked. Uh, because Stuart asked Emma, you also uh, regarding the custodian model. I'm sure, Stuart, if you want to, you can uh, uh, you can explain it very quickly. Um, where I think one specific in a group takes responsibilities for governance, safety, security, and other administrative activities. Uh, so to 
to kind of link up uh, um, especially smaller um, uh, market actors in such a procurement situation because they often find it difficult to react to big complex uh, procurement um, procurement calls etc uh, if you had looked at this if this is maybe part of your of your of, of what you're looking at so we didn't look it's, it's interesting you say that from the procurement aspect we didn't look at it from this that angle um, we did hear very favorably um, about a couple of um, big open source projects where they have they have very clear ownership so DHIS2 um, which has really close um, close relationships with I think it's the University of Oslo as a, as a custodian there's one called Mojo Loop which has clear clear ownership as well um, but it kind of has external funders so I would say we came across a, a couple of examples of where this has worked well um, and I think in, in general it's a very a very a very positive model that we should be doing more of or we or we need to have more of all right I, I maybe respond, no, I, sorry i couldn't respond just then i had to switch my microphone off and and lost you for a sec while i was doing it um yes yeah, thank you emma i did hear your response there i actually bumped into mojo loop on friday uh just out of uh chance and we were discussing that very point about the custodian model um yeah the custodian model really is um it, it, what it considers is what are all of the actors that might be needed to service a public sector customer and from the conversations with uh, crown commercial a few years ago um, they of course have on one side the desire to have a single supplier or, or five suppliers because it makes life easier for them in some respects equally they don't like the flavor of the monopoly that that then brings and so you have this this dichotomy as to what what they need and the, the custodian model becomes the abstraction between what they really need which is a small amount of organizations to deal with certainly from safety security governance all of that from a from a customer perspective trivia that really they don't want to have to worry about or they want to have someone who they can offset the risk to whilst having that innovation that that federated supply chain with resilience and redundancy across different organizations and no one uh, organization who who can um from the supply side uh, distort what the customer is trying to do so that's the really the the concept around the, the custodian it considers the technical service providers and the governance this has worked very well through through a project in the nhs which i think is probably the second most successful healthcare open source project that's happened uh, rapidly gaining pace uh, through the, the UK and, and it has communities of clinicians working together um, design as the product design team and technical service providers and so on so it's, it's a really good example and I think when you talk about best practice um, certainly from from my perspective and following this for the last six or seven years it does seem to be a, a very solid approach and it is delivering against that so I'd be very happy to, to talk further with you after this yeah, that sounds good. And I think, um, you know, that the, the scope of our study was was quite narrowly um, on actions governments should, can, can take. So it'd be interesting to know how how you see them, what, what their role is in is encouraging that kind of model. Um, but let's let's take that one offline, I think. Yeah. Okay.